Are we on? Yes, we're on. Hello, everybody. How are you going? Good. <laughs> um, my name's Holly, aka Jack River, and this is the first ever Climate Hour. It's been my dream for some time to bring my other passions into the Jack River world, and tonight happens to be the first time with uh, the most incredible panel, honestly, I could dream of. I would have dreamed of this as a kid or, you know, teenager when Take Three started, listening to Dr. Carl on the radio and being a massive fan of the World Wildlife Fund and also Heidi from Cloud Control here. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'll introduce our incredible panel. We've got uh, Leslie Hughes, Professor Leslie Hughes from Macquarie University. She's a counsellor the Climate Council, the director of the WWF, World Wildlife Fund, and she's the former Climate Commissioner of the government, which is amazing. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> We've got the amazing Dr. Carl, who needs no introduction. I'm sure you've heard him on the radio for many years, and also he's an acclaimed writer. So thank you, Dr. Carl. Hang on. Um, so, Leslie's not with the Worldwide Wrestling Foundation? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I should have checked that with her previous. <laughs> um, we've got Tim Silverwood, the founder and CEO of Take Three for the Sea, which I'm sure you're also very familiar with. Incredible organisation that encourages us to take three pieces of rubbish from the beach every time we go. Or more. You're allowed to take or more. Or more, yes. <laughs> three plus. <laughs> Uh, we also have a special guest tonight, Heidi Lenfer of Cloud Control, who's you, um, been my friend for a very long time. And just two days ago, she launched the incredible company Feet, Future Energy Artists, uh, which is a solar fund for touring artists and their audiences. So um, you might have seen me talk about that, but we'll, yeah, talk about that more soon. So um, this is our panel tonight. And... I guess I just wanted to get these amazing people on one panel and ask, what is climate change? What can we do about it? Why is it quite hard to understand and why is it sometimes a little bit hard to act and, you know, want to see if we're heading for an okay future or if we're all going to die, et cetera. Uh, <laughs> so I guess, yeah. <laughs> um, Firstly, we're going to go around the panel and uh, get to know these amazing people. So I'd like to know who you are, where you're from, what you do, and what drives you to do the work that you do. So we'll start with Leslie. Okay. Um, thanks, Holly. Is this on? Is that on, everyone? Yes, OK. A bit yeah, hard to good. tell from here. Um, OK, so my name's Leslie Hughes. I'm an ecologist by training. I'm an academic full-time at Macquarie University, where I've been for a long time. Um, I got interested in climate change impacts on species and ecosystems um, more than 20 years ago, and that's been my main research topic. Um, but beyond that, um, I came to the sort of slow realisation that just doing research at a university wasn't really enough, um, wasn't satisfying enough. So over the last 10 or 15 years, I suppose, I've been uh, working for various organisations sort of as a hobby, um, doing communication about climate change. Um, as Holly mentioned, I was a, one of the six climate commissioners that the Gillard government um, appointed, um, only to be sacked two and a half years later by Mr Abbott when he became Prime Minister on the second day of office. We were, our sacking was his first political act. Uh, we started the Climate Council then, we appealed to the public for donations and five and a half years later we're, we're still going with um, nearly 30 staff. So uh, More we've, than Tony. Out, outlasted, <laughs> we've outlasted the Abbott Prime Ministership now by um, a considerable margin. So if any of you are Climate Council supporters, thank you very much. Um, we've now got 100, 100 reports out there, lots of videos, um, a huge amount of resources. So if you do need any resources about climate change, please go to the Climate Council website. I'll stop there. So good. That's where Heidi and I, and I'm sure many people, go to get our information. So thank you so much. Cool. And uh, now we will introduce Dr. Carl. Hi. Um, 
I've been well educated for free for 16 years uh, because I come from a time when the Australian government thought that education was a worthwhile investment in the future. So I'm qualified in physics, maths, engineering, medicine, surgery and a few other things. I did my first story reading about climate change um, back in the early 70s, did my first uh, story on radio 1980. Maybe it's real, maybe it's not. 1985 did in a book, maybe it's real, maybe it's not. 1989 did it on TV, it's real. Um, and have been doing stories about it ever since, trying to bring the facts rather than emotions to what has somehow wrongly been turned into a debate because it's perfectly clear that climate change is real, we caused it, and we can fix it. The important <laughs> thing is we can fix it. Read the January issue, Scientific American, pages 52 to 60, we can pull a year's worth of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Don't feel bleak, feel positive, we can fix it. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. And Tim Silverwood. Well, I think we can all go home now because yeah. uh, we're, we're, it's, everything's going to be okay. Now, I do, um, I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist. Uh, that's one of the things that we really try and instill uh, behind that take three for the sea ideology. It's that notion that yes, there's all these problems, the ocean is filling up with plastic, but that should not be a cause for alarm and it should not be a, concern, a, con a cause for inaction. So every time you take three for the sea, you're sending a message to others and to the oceans that we've got this, we've got your back. And that really is where my origin story comes from. I uh, grew up in a family <laughs> that had uh, environmental interests. I had a chance to explore the bushland around my home as a young person, so I really became very attracted to this 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 complex ecosystem that I was a part of. And so, uh, when it came through high school and university, I studied the sciences and sustainability. And uh, many years later, met two other wonderful, uh, remarkable women, Amanda and Roberta. And in 2009, we launched uh, Take Three for the Sea. So you heard the message. It's very, very simple. Um, pick three pieces up when you leave a special place. And hopefully share that online with that Take Three for the Sea hashtag. And in doing so, you're inspiring others to join that social movement. So at last count, that hashtag, over 100,000 uses on Instagram, 129 countries around the world. And if you actually look into the environmental impact that we're having, it's over 10 million pieces of rubbish that people <laughs> like you and us are picking up every year from the environment. So that's at least getting a conversation started about plastic pollution in the ocean. But of course, the conversation needs to turn into action. And that's why I'm so happy to be here today. And how good's Holly for putting this on? Woo. Big round of applause, Holly. You're so good. Thank you. I uh, feel very privileged to have you all here with me. Thank you. Um, now, Heidi. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Heidi from Cloud Control and I'm, I've probably been in the game the shortest time of anyone on this stage, but I traditionally play in a band all the time. But in the last two years, I've been on a journey to figure out a strategy for how artists can respond to the climate crisis and how we can actively pursue the solutions that we know the world needs and how we can accelerate them. So. Leaning heavily on the research, actually, of the Climate Council and on a trip to the Great Barrier Reef that I went to um, that was put on by the Climate Council and learning all about the bleaching, the terrible bleaching events going on there, I started figuring out what the industry could do differently when we get on planes for a living. So two days ago, I've launched FEET, which is Future Energy Artists, and we are getting all of Australia's bands to fund solar farms around Australia. Because what we do know is that the whole world needs to convert to a renewables-based economy as quickly as possible. So I thought, why not accelerate that here in Australia? And how can we do that? Well, all of our bands are investing um, whatever they can afford. Maybe it's $5, maybe it's 5% of the touring profits, maybe it's a lump sum from their savings. I've, we've made it as completely as flexible as possible. So uh, we launched two days ago and you can check us out on our website and we've already had probably 600 signups on the website and we're processing all of our artist applications. Today, I was emailing a lot of people today, so it's really <laughs> nice to get out of the house and talk to real people. That's awesome. So yeah, I guess Heidi and I have met up a lot of times over the past, I don't know, two or three years because we are so inspired by all the people that we get to see, but I never get to speak 
to you guys. I'm always on a stage singing songs and get to talk a little bit, but we both really wanted to, to make more tangible change and have more tangible conversations. So I guess um, both of us come from the same place in that way. Um, so I think we'll jump into it. And I want to ask the hard questions that we, um, the hard questions are the kind of biggest Carl not, said not to say dumb questions, but I mean, they feel a little dumb to me, but I'm just going to ask them. Um, so, Leslie, what is the simplest way you can explain climate change to us? Okay, well, um, without greenhouse gases around the Earth's surface, we'd be much, much colder than uh, we are now. And we need those, uh, we need that atmosphere to, to keep us warm. But by mining fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas <clears throat> out of the Earth's crust and taking that carbon and eventually releasing it into the atmosphere, plus a whole lot of other greenhouse gases, but CO2 is the, the really the most important one, um, we are changing the way that heat from the sun gets trapped close to the Earth's surface. And over time, um, since the Industrial Revolution, when we've been putting all that extra CO2 out there, um, that atmosphere has become much more effective at trapping heat near the Earth's surface. Um, so we're getting warmer, but alongside getting warmer, the, the distribution of heat and the way that energy is being uh, increased in the Earth system is changing the whole climate. And one of the things it's doing is that it's making what we call extreme weather events, things like floods or droughts or um, following on the bushfires, it's making them more frequent in many places and more intense, and that's where the impacts come. I'm sure Carl will want to add to that explanation. Thank you. That was, that was terrific. Um, oh, and I will. Thank you for laying the ground. <laughs> so, the, the yeah, the, so the sun <laughs> chucks out heat at a temperature of 5,000 degrees. That's the temperature of the sun. It comes into the atmosphere. It hits the carbon dioxide that's already there. It doesn't even see it. it. goes straight through it, hits the ground. So it hits the ground, warms it up, and then the ground radiates the heat back into space in that direction at a um, temperature of about 15 degrees centigrade. At that lower temperature, it does see the carbon dioxide. It goes up and it sees the carbon dioxide and then that carbon dioxide bounces some of the heat back down again. It used to be 280 parts per million, now it's 415. When the heat comes up, it gets caught and then it comes down. Number one, the amount of heat that's sent back down to the ground by the carbon dioxide is roughly 420,000 Hiroshima bombs worth of heat every day. Secondly, and we need some of it, because otherwise, as you said, we'd be at minus 15. If there was none, it would be minus 15 degrees C, terrible. 280, just nice. 415 parts per million, bad. So the heat goes, of that heat, that 420,000 Hiroshima bombs per day, if it stayed in the atmosphere, we'd be dead, because it'd be too hot. 93% goes into the ocean, and we've measured it. So the theory tells us we should be getting that much heat. On the ground, we're measuring that much heat being trapped in the air and the ocean. And we've had a series of satellites over the last 30 years overlapping. And they've measured exactly that amount of heat going no longer into space. It used to come up, now it's going down. And now the ocean will hand to the ocean man. Thank you, firstly, for your explanations, which are very clear. And I'm beginning to understand clearly. But Tim... You're the ocean guy. What do you have to add to this? I'm just so thankful we started at that end of the panel. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have been really underwhelming with our climate I'm, change. I'm at that end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I, I, I'd like to obviously leverage off that and take a bit of a glimpse at our oceans because climate change is the, is the message that we often hear or climate crisis, climate emergency, but we also face an ocean emergency, an ocean crisis, because it covers most of our uh, planet's surface and it's the home to more species than we could ever even imagine. And of course, only 5% you know, of it has been explored. And so I'm an ocean baby, I'm a surfer, I'm fanatical about every, everything ocean. And so for me, I even like to create these parallels between climate change and, and obviously CO2 being this problem that we can't really see. I mean, we can see this smoke haze around us here and we can understand that that's what's happening around this city and around our urban areas every single day, CO2 being emitted. 
But when you look at plastic pollution and you hear these statistics about the oceans filling up with plastic, that there's going to be more plastic in the sea than fish by 2050 if we continue on our current trajectory, then that's an irrefutable image. You can see that problem firsthand. So I'd like to see much more conversation and correlation between uh, climate change and the impacts that we're having on our ocean with man-made items like plastic pollution because I think they can actually create lots of synergies together and help us as people feel and see the problem. And I think that's really what we're struggling with at the moment is we're not finding a way of it becoming emotive. It clearly is for you. You all came here tonight because you care deeply about this. You want to increase your understanding and you want to be tasked up with tools and solutions you can take forward. So that's really what I want to do as an environmentalist is make us feel it, make us see it, and have that turn into actions that we all do every day in our little spheres of influence. Awesome. And that's why we're here. We're going to work through a couple of things and hopefully arrive at some really clear action points. So, yeah, Hyads, anything to add? Yeah, well, in a similar vein as Tim, I guess I wanted to give artists a tangible um, outcome to their work. So I wanted to give them a solution that they could point to and walk through and feel like they'd created something together that was actually, you know, helping to create the solution that we need. So by building solar farms, I latched onto that as the thing that artists could do because artists are used to creating things from nothing. You know, a song just starts as an idea and then it becomes something that's forever in the world. And I thought artists need their imagination sparked by potentially a solution that is as creative as the work that they do in, in their band life. So by building the infrastructure, that we can, in one year's time, walk through a beautiful array of solar panels and know that collectively this wouldn't have existed had we not taken action. That's something that we can do that's uh, in the similar vein as Tim removing plastic every day from the ocean. So I'm excited to see what, that, what people can do with running with that as the imaginative spark for our organisation. Awesome. And yeah, so I guess taking that information and putting it all together, I, I mean, I absolutely believe that science and technology and artists and creatives all need to work together to find creative solutions to this issue. Um, but so straight to the next point is can we fix it and what are the most... Um, innovative and effective ways that people are combating climate change or that everyone here should be aware of? Leslie, Carl, Tim. Leslie. I'll start. <clears throat> okay, so I think we've got to... Climate change is really, really complicated. Yes. <clears throat> CO2 is coming from... And greenhouse gases are coming from all sorts of different processes all over the world, and we're all partly responsible for that. So we can't think of climate change as being bad and then fixed like that. It's not, yes. it's not a dichotomy. So the climate that we're experiencing right now is due to the greenhouse gases that have been put into the atmosphere over the last few decades. What we're doing now will affect climate in the next few decades. So it's not a matter, you know, it is like an ocean liner trying to turn it round. It's very, very slow and it's very, very complicated. So there's no one quick fix and it's no, there's no black or white solution. So there have to be millions and billions of individual actions, um, actions by people, actions by communities, actions by governments and by business. So we have to add all of those together and the way I, I'm often reminded, remember that um, there was an anti-smoking campaign a few years ago um, that took a sort of a different attitude to, to trying to stop people smoking. Instead of saying, you know, if you smoke, you're going to die, you're going to get lung cancer, blah, 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 they said, you know, an hour after you stop smoking, this will happen. A week after you stop smoking, this positive thing will happen. A year after you stop smoking, this will happen. They took a very positive attitude to the good things. And I think that's got to be a really big part of our communications message. And the way I see it now is that every single molecule of carbon dioxide that we can prevent going into the atmosphere will have will mean that the situation isn't as bad as it would have been if it had gone in. Yep. So if we think about all of our individual and collective actions as prevention of a worse outcome, 
I actually think that's a more positive way of moving forward than being totally unrealistic and saying, well, this government should fix it because that's not going to work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we'll talk about that more tonight, but mindset of every individual is just so important because that's where everything starts and ends really with the individual and what they choose to do. So um, we'll hand to Dr. Carl for some badass science <laughs> chat and then we'll um, talk about those actions from you guys, what you do every day. So the question is, can we fix it? Yes, Dr. Carl. On the 7th of December, 1941, Pearl Harbor got bombed. Within months, everything in America had been turned into fighting the war. And factories were pumping out, car factories were no longer making cars, and they were pumping out the uh, B-17 bombers big enough to fill this whole room at the rate, one factory alone, and there were hundreds of them, at the rate of not one a month, one an hour. We can fix it. Where we have to fix it is with political decision from the top. The fish rots from the head. So we're getting carbon dioxide from electricity, from transport, from industry, from agriculture and livestock. If, we, if the governments of the world decided to do it, I'm just going right to the top, if the governments of the world decided to do it, we could go electricity being carbon free in 10 years, transport including aeroplanes in 15 years, livestock and agriculture, it's got DNA, it's alive, it'll fight us, I'm thinking 30 to 40 years. If you, there are many ways mentioned in this article in the Scientific American. One of them involves building machines. How many? 25 million machines built in Switzerland can pull back one year's worth of carbon dioxide out of the air. And you're thinking, there's no way we can make 25 million machines. We make 80 million new cars every year. We just have to have you in politics making the decision. <laughs> like nice. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to echo a lot of those sentiments from Dr. Carl there. I think that humans created these problems, and so, of course, humans can fix them, we can reverse them, and we are a remarkable species when our backs are up against the wall. The, the, war, uh, the, you know, backs against the wall. The war example is a really good one. CFCs are another one, and there's many other examples as well out there. So I just think that um, we've got some real challenges around communication on this issue. I think the, the example that Leslie used there around smoking and being able to change the conversation across from a smoking is bad to actually starting to show that the optimistic tone. Um, there's a great documentary out that's just been released recently, um, 2040, by Damon Gamow, who made that sugar film, and it, it, it operates under the same premise. But unfortunately, I think we have to face down the fact that there is still this strong denial campaign, and it's affecting people in a lot of communities now where that is still prospering that. So I think the smoking analogy, would you say, Leslie, was on the back of that there was a broad scale consensus or understanding that smoking is bad. And that's kind of what, there's still that gap there that we're facing, that people are actually out there now still denying it and still refuting the, the clear science. Can I just say something about denialists? I think we get a little bit too obsessed on a very small percentage of the population that are what I would call hardcore denialists. It's about 6% and it's been about that for a very long time. I think that the greater challenge, be, and people ask me all the time, well, what do you say to the denialist? And I always say, I don't say anything to them. You know, it's a waste of time. Focus. Got better things to do. Um, the, the bigger challenge is the rest of the population or a large chunk of the rest of the population that doesn't realise the urgency. You know, they're, they're on board with the science, they understand the basics, they know it's a problem, but they don't realise it's the biggest problem. You know, they, they focus quite understandably on paying their mortgage and getting a job and sending their kids to school and all of that sort of thing. It's actually that the timing question is the biggest issue. Um, it's not whether there's a few, you know, old white men out there that, that don't believe. So I think we've got to really focus on talking to the converted. People say to me all the time, oh, you're just preaching to the converted. That's what we're doing now. Actually, it's the converted that are going to take action. They're the people that we do need, but we need them to take action and to make climate change the number one issue, not the number five issue that they care about. And on that um, point of urgency, 
once you have that urgency in your hands, where is it best directed in your opinions? I wanted to ask you both, oh, well, sorry, you all, what do you, what are the immediate actions people need to take? And that could be toward government or individually, if you could surmise those actions, because we feel the urgency, but it's, you know, what are those immediate things? We, we know some basics, I'm sure everyone knows that, you know, we need to eat less meat and we need to use public transport, we need to buy electric cars, but what would you like people to do with that urgency? Somebody. Start with Holly. Heidi. 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 I was like, don't give it back to me. <laughs> Too many Dr. Anxious. Carl, surely. Yeah. Um, firstly, uh, individually, in our case, since 2007, we have been a net producer of electricity and have used up more electricity than we have uh, bought. Uh, so we're giving more into the grid than we use. Um, secondly, you move from the personal level into the local government and then the state government and the federal and basically you get in there and you become politically active. If you are spending your time shouting at the TV, that's not a bad start, but be the one on the TV. Be the one who is making the decisions. That's where it is. Chairman Mao Zedong said, power grows out of the barrel of a gun, but not in Western society. Power grows out of politics, out of the parliament. And so if you're in power on a political level, you can make decisions instead of shouting at the people who made the decisions that you don't like. And the best and cleverest thing that the politicians ever did was convince you so that when you say to somebody, oh, you should run into politics, and the answer is, oh, I don't want to do that, they're crooked, they have won. If you laugh, meaning there's no way you do it, and you say they're crooked, meaning leave them in power, they've won. So you might have remembered at one stage, John Howard spent a lot of time walking around Sydney in some pastel pyjamas with something on the back about uh, a sports team or something. Everybody paid attention to that. At the same time, he spent three quarters of the Australian entire budget on submarines that don't work. You should be in power. Okay, awesome. And I think that's an important mindset change to understand that you can, every individual can jump in and do something and we're, you know, moving closer to understanding what that something is. But I, I guess it's up to what you're good at as an individual and where your passion is and, you know, who you're surrounded by, what you can influence. But um, if we're talking about government, I really wanted to ask uh, the panel what are those changes to policy or, you know, where, where should the audience look and where should I look to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, I mean, the number one thing that we've all got once we turn 18 is a vote. So that's the number one thing to do. Um, and then as people get older, they tend to get more money and thinking about where your money is, who you're investing in, where your superannuation is, is also really important. Um, I, I agree, I'd love to see more scientists go into politics. Um, I'm not prepared to do it myself, so um, I guess that's a little bit hypocritical, um, eating less meat and all of those things that we all know about. But I think just making climate change the absolute number one reason for voting for a party or doing anything is, is the best thing that we can all do. Yeah. Okay, awesome. And I would say as well that um, everyone doesn't need to be like a shiny outward facing leader kind of person to do this. Like um, I think you need to find, like Hall was saying, like what your strengths are and what your interests are and also know the power of being the first follower. Like find people who are in your networks who are doing things that you can identify as being really uh, worthwhile and then support them. You don't need to start a thing you can, uh, like, it's, it's often more beneficial to corral a few people and, you know, bolster something that's already got wheels that's moving. So have a think, have a think about where those wheels might be turning in your circle of friends. Nice. That's so true. Uh, 
I was just going to really once again um, support some of the things that were already been said here that do recognise that sphere of influence you have. And yes, you can get told sometimes that you're, you're singing from the same song sheet, but you can help that choir sing louder and sing more in tune. So really do focus on those people that are around you that can strengthen you and, and take you forward and always be learning and always be, be building your understanding as best as you can without getting drowned in these processes. Because sometimes I've, I meet a lot of people who who try and do too much and you end up spreading yourself out really, really thin trying to tackle all these issues and it can lead to burnout. So don't be afraid to just recognise where your strength is and focus on that. Um, so, yeah, that's my little contribution. Yeah, Holly, one of the things I was going to say, because you did, I remember, ask about the government, I think one thing we should demand of our governments is that they stop subsidising fossil fuels because it's billions and billions of dollars and instead put that money into fostering new innovation in energy and, and research into the agricultural sector, et cetera. So yeah. they don't even have to spend more money. They just have to direct the money in a different direction. Yeah, and um, absolutely echo what you said. And I um, think that, you know, it, also don't be afraid to try those different things. I mean, I feel pretty um, weird and dorky doing Climate Hour, but it's so incredible once we get going. It's great. So... <laughs> <laughs> I know you, you feels out there if you're wondering what to do and how to do it. you just got to, I don't know, take a step, really. Um, and now back to government. I really wanted to get some specifics um, for the audience like you were just talking about. So what are those really key things to look for in policy? Because um, there's a kind of gap between reading climate policy of the Labor Party and Greens Party, maybe not Liberals, I don't know, but... Um, and then, you know, reading articles um, on the Climate Council website. What are the key things to look for? In terms of government, what government can do? Yeah, what government yep. can do. Yep. Well, um, we should be, as the Australian government should certainly be committing to a far higher target, a Paris, the Paris Climate Change um, target. At the moment, um, this government's committed to 26% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030 compared to 2005, and they deliberately chose that 2005 baseline because it was a really high uh, baseline, so it makes it easier to, to get underneath. Um, globally, it's considered that that's a really, really weak target. It's totally inadequate. In fact, even if all of the targets um, that 195 countries have signed up to all over the world are met 100% and on time, it'll still get us to three degrees. So um, collectively, the targets aren't, aren't high enough um, and certainly the Australian target is not high enough. Um, the Climate Change Authority, which was the body set up to advise government on targets, said 45 to 65 would be th percent would be doing our bit, um, but our government went for 26 percent. So for a start, we need to have a, a much higher commitment um, and then have a decent plan to get there. And one of the most important things the government needs to do is that we know that coal is a declining industry globally. The, the market for coal is, is declining rapidly. We have to look after and transition all of those communities um, that are dependent on coal. The, the just transition movement is, is really important and, and that's really a role for government. Um, but our government, we also have to recognise that we can replace the electrons in our energy system really easily, really, comparatively, because we know how to do it. Um, but it's a lot harder to replace the $30 billion worth of income that coal royalties bring into the Australian economy. So that's really the challenge. It's not the technology, it's the income. Mm -hmm. So what government needs to be doing is starting to invest really um, decisively in alternative and innovative technologies where we can lead the world and bring the income to replace what we'll lose from the coal market. Yeah, and those renewables can make returns similar to coal? Well, certainly there's, there is talk now about the hydrogen economy. I'm sure Dr. Carl could explain the hydrogen economy much uh, more effectively than I could. But I think, you know, Australia is a highly educated country. We've got a great scientific community. Um, we have a still abundant natural resources other than fossil fuels. We should be harnessing them into new innovation, new smart manufacturing, uh, because we do have to, if we all want to maintain the nice lifestyle we have, um, we have to to replace that $30 billion, and it's a challenge. Got to find the cash. Yeah. Got to find the cash. Awesome. Thank you. And 
Dr. Carl. Um, there's a document you can find on the web. It's called Zero Carbon Australia Stationary Energy Plan. It runs like this. If we use renewables to make all of our electricity for the next 30 years, the cost will be $800 billion spread over 30 years. But if we do it from fossil-based fuels, the cost will be three times higher, spread out over 30 years. Why? Well, here's a secret that they don't tell you. But if you don't have to pay for the fuel, it's cheaper. So it is actually cheaper for us to go renewable, not in the first week, but averaged out over the 30 years, and you guys and dudes and dudesses will all be around for the next 30 years. In the New York Times yesterday, there was an article saying that the cost to business of climate change is, out of a world budget for the whole world of $80 trillion, that's what the whole world generates as GDP, $80 trillion. at the moment the cost is $1 trillion. It's actually costing us money to not go renewable. However, there's a big push to say, let's just keep the machine rolling, business as usual. The data is coming in hard and strong. And what you are talking about, what you're doing right now, and what you're talking about, Heidi, all of us, we're talking about fertilising the soil so that the change can come. And I'm just so honoured to be part of what you've done. Oh, thank you, Carl. <laughs> I'm going to cry. <laughs> and, and the change is already underway with the, you know, we're in the biggest boom of renewables we've ever seen. There's been 20, 80 billion dollars invested last year worldwide, and 20 billion of that was in Australia. And a lot of that, inf a lot of that money is coming from overseas. So what I'm all about <laughs> is getting, is getting, keeping that money invested here and getting Australians to have an ownership in the the clean grid that will be rolling out inevitably over the next 20 years. Absolutely. I think it's awesome to look at what California is doing. I can't quote right now. I'm not sure if anyone can, but it's so incredible to watch what that state is doing for itself. Yeah. yeah. Can anyone actually expand on that a little? Um, I might get the figures wrong, but um, yeah. the remarkable thing about California is they did have a target for 100% renewables, which I think was... Um, 2030, and they've brought that forward by 10 years. So it's actually exponential rather than linear. Um, so California is, ab and it's California's the fourth largest economy in the entire world. So, you know, we, we do need to look to California. And it also, California is a great example of, of what leadership can do. I mean, who knew that Arnold Schwarzenegger, Hi. I mean, you know, who would have ever predicted that? But his leadership as governor in California absolutely set the foundation for what they're doing now. So, and he's a Republican, so that just goes to show some surprising things sometimes. Okay, just on the, that political thing, in the United Kingdom, the Conservative Party accepts the science of climate change, but the non-conservative party does not. Irrational. And in Australia, it's the other way around. Also irrational. Pick it up for Arnie. Loved him when he came back. He, he, his body looked great. Didn't he look good? Oh. Did he come back? He's always back. <laughs> I'd be back. Amazing. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, and... On a personal level, um, back down to the ground, could we go around the panel and talk about the daily actions of our panel members? What has your knowledge led to in your day-to-day -day life? Because, again, that's something that I think so many people wonder when you have all this knowledge, what do you do every day? Um, well, you know, I've done the usual thing, solar panels on the roof, trying to cut down meat eating. My daughter's in the audience and she will know that um, we live with two avowed carnivores, so that's been um, challenging. Um, for me personally, however, I guess um, I changed my career path um, and that's what I do every day. So while I am still an academic and, and do all the stuff that academics do, um, a considerable amount of my personal time is spent doing things like working for the Climate Council because I, I see that as where I can make the most difference to the most people. So. I guess that, that's what awesome. I do. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you for what you do, by the way. 
on a personal level, we've dropped our electricity use way down by just having where the computer is, where the entertainment boxes are, just one big switch. And you hit the switch and it all goes dead apart from the really essential stuff like the recorder so you can record every single episode of the Kardashians ever. <laughs> then, but we still keep that going with meat. Uh, heading down that pathway, you're right, we're, we're now getting lab-grown meat, which is good from both the ethical side. The price has dropped from $5 million a kilogram down to the stage where it's now in America available as parte, which is all mushed up without texture. And within two years, you'll have lab-grown meat at the same price, but without the ethical and carbon issues. We compost like crazy. Um, we, we're growing our own... If anybody wants some mustard leaves and you're down in a bra, drop in, look for the house with the rainbow on the front and the pirate flag. We have got mustard leaves like crazy. And finally, for the first time ever in our history, we are doing so much recycling with the soft plastic and everything else and the cardboard and so forth that the amount of garbage for our red garbage bin on Thursday night was that much instead of the whole bin. And for the first time, I didn't wheel the bin out. Oh. First time ever. That's so awesome. we, we've reduced the garbage way down. And uh, luckily, um, our brother-in-law drops in his compost. So we've got lots of sauce. So he's got first access to the mustard leaves. You can come second. <laughs> so I suppose I've, I've, as I said before, grown up in, a, in an environmentally conscious family and I'm deeply rooted in my environmental philosophies and beliefs. So for me, there's like a... I try to have a bit of a lens over my everyday actions. And to me, that notion of thinking, particularly when it comes to consumables, obviously I'm into zero waste and reducing the impacts of plastic pollution, etc. So that thought process that you can actually bring into your life to say to yourself, well, where did this come from? What are the you know, intended or unintended consequences of this coming into my life? How am I going to let that then make and inform the decision I take about what's going to happen to it afterwards? And so I think it's really been wonderful to see over this decade journey I've, I've been able to undertake with Building Take Three, this movement of people around the world who are thinking about plastics and what's coming to their life, what is single use, and even looking at fashion, people that are now saying, well, I don't want to just go down that fast fashion route and grab this item that is going to have huge uh, consequences on humans and the environment. Why don't I go to the op shop or the second-hand dealer or look on eBay or Gumtree and buy something? I'm going to wear it with pride. I'm going to wear it 30 times or 300 times. So I really just think that practice of giving yourself a chance to think, and it's almost part of that slowing down. We live such a fast-paced existence. Everything has to be convenient, 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 above all else, and clearly it's not being convenient for the planet. So that, that's my you know, hope that you, some of you are already doing this and maybe some of you are on your little journey to, to, to thinking about the consequences of your actions a little bit more. Um, I, we've made a conscious decision in our house to uh, walk as much as possible and my, my husband rides his bicycle and sold his car. So I am a good little walker and I lived in London for four years and during that time I learned that like an hour's distance of walk is like totally fine. So I'm really trying to institute that here in Sydney, which is a bit harder because it's a bit more of an undulating terrain, but you can really do it. If you like Google map it and it's 45 to an hour, just walk it. Like don't even catch the train, just walk. It's really good for you and the environment. And the other thing I really try to do is um, stay not cynical. I know this sounds maybe less practical, but it's, it's super interesting. Um, a few years ago when I decided to actively try and shut down those moments in my mind where I, I'm like, oh, not, you know, the thing I'm doing is not going to change a thing if I just take that takeaway cup, cup, cup of coffee, you know. Um, if I just, as, as soon as you, not, you, you disallow cynicism and like actively subscribe to newsletters of people that put out positive news about the world and innovation and like you actually start to change the way your brain makes connections and you, you change your own mind. So I would recommend that because that's been one of the biggest changes I did. And I would recommend, actually, a little shout out to um, an online newsletter called Future Crunch. They collate, like, positive news stories from around the world and they deep dive. It's run by a political economist and another data scientist guy. And so it's, but it's kind of casually, irreverently written and it's really good read. 
So that comes out fortnightly. I digest that every day. I mean, regularly, fortnightly. So <laughs> recommend. Future Very funny guys. Future, Future crunch. crunch. Future crunch. Yeah. That's Melbourne. the website? Yeah. Melbourne guys. Awesome. Are you taking notes? Yeah. That's He's taking for notes me. for the team. I just assumed that they'd go into his brain and there'd be like a little filing system going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, thank you for all that. I think that all those perspectives cover all of the, you know, places we need to improve and I think it's awesome that you touched on mindset. I, does everyone agree? Do you all have, just quickly, because I want to hand some questions over to you guys. Um, I think mindset is so important and it can be a really quick answer, like yes, but have you all made that positive switch in your brains? Yes? Um, lots of people, yes. Lots yes. of people ask me whether I'm an optimist or a pessimist mm -hmm. and my response to that, well, I, I quote this... Um, 19th century Marxist politician, um, Antonio Gramsci, who, who, who really got it. And he said that, uh, he talked about the tension between the uh, pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. And I think any climate change scientist, or indeed any scientist, probably feels like that all of the time, that you, you have part of your brain that you know, understands the science and looks at the graphs and, you know, can feel pretty depressed at times, especially after certain elections. Um, and then the other part of your brain um, that that understands that, that hope is actually a strategy, not an emotion. You know, we actually have to have hope because if we don't have hope and optimism, well, then we just give up. Um, and then if we give up, then we're screwed. So, to me, hope is the strategy. That's such a not, cool take on it. Um, not just an emotion that we hopefully have. That's awesome. Hope as a strategy is new mantra. That's yeah. great. Love, Love um, it. Thank you. I agree with everything you said, except what about the election. On that Saturday morning, I was really thrilled that the Netherlands won Eurovision. I don't see what your problem is at all. First, we can fix climate change. Sex. Second, the Flynn effect. You had to get sex in there somehow. It's in. Done. Second, the Flynn that. effect. You are nine IQ points smarter than your parents. You don't know as much, but you're smarter than them. Don't worry, your kids will be smarter than you. So each generation is the smartest, and you are the smartest generation ever. Read that in my ABC homepage, The Flynn Effect. We can fix it. The Flynn Effect, you're smarter. Number three, finishing point. We are living in the most peaceful time ever in the history of the human race. Read Factfulness by Hans Rosling or Stephen Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. And I will be sending you a multiple IQ, multiple uh, choice exam question in five weeks to make sure you've done the reading. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Carl. Um, Tim, would you agree the, the positive mindset switch and hope as a strategy? Yep, I agree with all of that. And I think you, you can't be an environmentalist and you can't try and uh, you know, lead others through their environmental journey without being optimistic. Of course, you, you do have that part of your brain, as, as Leslie was acknowledging there, which sort of stacks up all those rational outcomes. But, you know, what does giving up look like? And for me, every time I pick up a plastic bottle cap as I'm walking to the cinema today or I say, walking to the theatre today or I say no plastic straw, I'm thinking about that albatross with plastic full of, a stomach full of plastic and that sea turtle with a, a, a plastic straw up its nose. So my personal decisions extend to those other living creatures that we share, this incredible blue dot that's hurtling through space at Carl will know how many, hour, how many miles an hour, but it's a special thing. So my actions are always part of that philosophy I have that we simply must act, we can, and we can, and we will, it's inevitable, fix this, we will. Yes. That's a, yes, Hides. Oh. You started this I was, combo. Oh, yeah. Oh, I don't get another round. No, you do, you I do. It's up to you. Well, I was, I was just going to finish up by um, just saying, yeah, and, like, you know, don't expect sainthood you know, from yourself straight away. Like, um, it's something that you, it's just, a, it's just a practice that you build up and I keep failing as well. And so you've just got to decide to try and um, make new habits. And working on that switch is so important. Um, my mum's in the audience and she knows I get packaging anxiety and I travel a lot as a job and I literally get so anxious. Like, I'll be so thirsty but won't have my water bottle and just won't get... Oh, like stuff like that. And I think it's, you know, switching off the negativity in your brain and understanding reality and, yeah, getting positive can make so many changes. So um, now this has been an incredible conversation. So thank you so much. Um,
we'd love to hand it over for some questions. Um, would you like to put your hand up and I will come and find you? I'm going to roam. We have a roving microphone. Have we got someone down here? Oh, over here? No We've got the hands up over here. Yeah. Oh, I can just cruise down. Whoa. Oh, no. I broke something. <laughs> we'll just put that there. <laughs> okay. Maybe just give your name and whichever person you would like to ask the question to. Hey, um, my name's Michelle. I'm actually from uh, an activist group called Extinction Rebellion. I'm not sure if you've heard of us. Um, just going back to something that was mentioned before about demanding more from our politicians, we know that, I mean, it's quite clear that the Liberal government are um, in bed with the fossil fuel industry, and so demanding that they actually stop subsidising coal um, is probably a little bit unrealistic. So. Um, what I would like to know is what do you think we should really be doing to demand more action from our government and what are your thoughts on mass civil disobedience? Open to anyone. I'll just give you some numbers. Um, of every dollar earned on planet Earth, seven cents goes to a fossil fuel company as a subsidy on average. In Australia, it's about two or three percent, it's a bit lower, but every single one of us in this room is giving each year to the fossil fuel industry roughly $1,286, each of us. Who's got the cure now? <laughs> Not me, somebody else. <laughs> yeah, look, I, um, I'm really interested to see what this next phase of environmentalism looks like on the back of the incredible campaigns that Extinction Rebellion are um, undertaking across the planet. And so, look, I don't, um, I don't know the answer. I don't have any words of wisdom to offer other than um, keep going, keep exploring whatever works in your sphere of influence because doing something is a heck of a lot better than sitting around and doing nothing. Ah, I can offer one bit of advice. Read the book Econo Babble by Richard Dennis, D N N I W -S, S, and that will blow your mind as to what's really going on. It's really easy to read. You can read in half an afternoon. Richard Dennis, Econo Babble. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, okay, we've got a couple of very excited questions down here. Hi, my name's Ruben. Um, I'd like to ask you a question, Dr. Carl. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, the production of machines and um, the, um, take us back to the 25 million machines that we'd need to produce for the CO2, to reduce CO2. Uh, do we currently have those machines, um, sorry, reduce CO2, um, do we currently have those machines to reduce them or are trees more efficient than the machines we have now to uh, absorb CO2? Um, yeah. They're all part of the package, so uh, you can get the article online, Scientific American, January, pages 52 to 60. They deal with seven ways of dealing with carbon dioxide and pulling it out of the atmosphere, a mixture of industrial and biological and agricultural, and each of them they, they plot on a graph of uh, how many dollars it'll cost per tonne or gigaton to pull it out and how much you can pull out in total. So they will all, even just the industrial one, look up Climeworks, C-L-I-M-E-W-O-R-K-S. They're in Switzerland. They've had stuff running since 2017. They're the mob of which we build uh, 25 million machines. We can pull back one year's worth of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The only thing stopping us is that we haven't allocated the budget to do that. So we support people, as you say, who will put the budget that way. Awesome, thank you. All right, um, got a couple more questions. Would you like to ask your question? Hi, I'm Henry. Um, I was just wondering, I'm a vegetarian, and I was wondering um, if being a vegetarian is helping? A anyone? Uh, de <laughs> uh, definitely yes. So if you're eating cow, the cow usually has been fed corn, which you can eat. So there's an inefficiency. The soil makes the corn, and instead of you eating the corn, the corn then goes to the cow, and then you eat the cow. So there are many health benefits to vegetarianism, but you have to look after B12 
and iron, and that's a difficult path to go down. And we have a vegetarian daughter, and even though both my wife and I are doctors, we got it wrong and she went iron deficient. You can do it. It's my fault. I take except blame for everything. So vegetarian is definitely a pathway of lower drain on the resources of the planet. And if you do it properly, you can uh, get all your nutrients, no worries at all. Awesome. And Leslie, did you want to add anything to that? Or are you... Um, yeah, look, I think there is a, there's some really interesting trends going on in the world at the moment. So generally, as countries get richer, and we're seeing that in Asia especially, as there's a growing middle class, their consumption of meat and dairy goes up. It's a really, really strong correlation between an income into a country and how much meat they eat. Um, but now what we're seeing in um, highly developed countries like Australia is that the, the trend to, in the other direction towards vegetarianism is also um, increasing. So at the moment, those two things... We're, we're, the world is still consuming more meat each year, but not as much as it would have if the vegetarianism trend um, wasn't happening. So, you know, I think that it is something else that, that we should be at least aiming to reduce meat consumption. And as Carl mentioned earlier, there is now um, these impossible burgers and things like that. Um, you know, I think probably in 10 years' time, we will all be regularly buying um, plant-based fake meat for products much more from, from supermarkets. So awesome. um, at the moment, of course, we've got to remember that a lot of vegetarian products that a lot of vegetarians consume are still very highly processed. You know, things like tofu is a highly processed um, product and that takes energy. So eating fresh fruit and vegetables is always going to be, be, be better. But I think, you know, over the next 10 years, it's going to be quite an exciting time in the the growing movement of vegetarianism. Yeah. And just to add to that, um, uh, I know that the eating of meat is like, it's a really deeply held emotional thing for a lot of people. And, um, and so I'd encourage you, if you're trying to make an, an environmentally based decision to become a vegetarian or to at least reduce your meat consumption, like, yeah, I really applaud you in trying to do that. Even if it's just like, a, you know, going a meat-free day just starting like that and then maybe just going you know what I'm just going to eat meat on special occasions or just on weekends it all really helps so don't think that you have to be full-time veg for it to make a difference awesome thank you next question um hi my name's Mary Jane funny um I was wondering what you guys are doing globally for all of this um, saying it to just Australian people isn't enough. Obviously, my family are all immigrants. I'm a second-generation immigrant. My mum is now an Australian from migrating to Australia. So what are you guys doing for immigration purposes to let them know what they're getting themselves into due to global climate change and whatnot? My mum doesn't know too much about it. She's... 50 now and she's learnt from her past that she's a Christian and this is inevitable. So what are you all doing to educate her due to this? Any of you? Um, I, I don't think we're doing it very well. So I think, yeah. I mean, it's a great point that you raise. Um, I think still most of our communication in, about social or environmental issues, be it about climate change or other things, are still very much... Um, uh, aimed towards an English-speaking, um, probably Anglo-cultural majority. Um, so I, I, I'm not trying to make excuses. I, I don't think we do it very well. I don't think we do climate change communication to non-Anglo, uh, non-English-speaking groups within Australia. It's actually something that's... Um, I mentioned before I was a director of WWF, which means I'm on the board of WWF, um, and we have a lot of discussions about... Um, trying to understand um, alternative cultural perspectives on environmentalism, for example, because most NGOs in Australia that are always trying to get money, um, they, they're tending to ask for money from people that look just like them. So I think um, we need to do an awful lot better within our climate change or any other environmental education at talking to diverse audiences. We don't do it very well, but it's something we should work on. It's a good question. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Very sadly, we've only got time for 
one more question, but I feel like I could do a little post and we can convince the panel to um, answer some questions if you've got any left. So we can head to my Instagram or anyone up here's Insta. Um, but one more question, here we go. Hi, um, my name's Imogen, and I just want to say, first off, Tim, I think they should have cast you as Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have his body, but I could work on it with the right trainer. You're getting the hair, I reckon. <laughs> um, I just want to know, how do we enforce that or even just inspire um, that positive change within our community and our friendship groups and our families and break that barrier of stubbornness and that cynical mindset? Yeah, I think um, there's been a bit of conversation today about where to focus your energies. And I remember I went the year after Heidi went to the Great Barrier Reef with the Climate Council to do one of these immersions. And Anna Rose, who is an incredible um, environmentalist and conservationist and campaigner, just drew a simple sort of bell curve and just said, look, this is the population here. On one side, you're going to have those people that are completely on board with these conversations that we're talking about tonight. And on the other side, we're going to have people that are in complete denial. So we really shouldn't be wasting our time with those people that are on the far end of the spectrum when we can be bringing more people over from that centre of that bell curve in to join the masses. And so I think that's a really important thing. Play to your strengths. Don't get overwhelmed and frustrated and angry by those people that are causing those emotions in you. Focus those energies where you actually get more energy and you can do so much more. And that's, I mean, that sounds simple when you look at it as a graph. It can actually be really hard, particularly when there are people in your social or family circles that you really, really want to be on board. But there's no point um, expecting to do the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. That's the theory of insanity. Isn't that about right? Can I just add to that? Look, one of the things we talk about on the Climate Council a lot is, is the message of co-benefit. You know, um, for example, Cory Bernardi, I believe, who started the, one of the, cons the conservative parties, um, has got solar panels on his roof, presumably to save money. You know, from an atmospheric point of view, it doesn't matter if you put solar panels on your roof because you're like us or because you just want to save on your electricity bill. The impact is the same. So I think we need to think about what the impact of actions are. The reason for making the action isn't actually important for, for the atmosphere, which is what counts. So if we can bring people along to do the right actions, even for what you might think is not the right reason, it's the outcome that matters. So think from the outcome and how you get to the outcome. You don't have to necessarily change people's thinking. You actually need to change their actions. Um, that's what counts. So, you know, getting people to understand the, the, the co-benefits, whether they be health or clean air or, or saving money or an electricity or whatever, um, it's, the, it's the outcome of the action that's really important. That's a great point. And um, pretty incredible note to end things on, I think, unless anyone has anything to add. This has been such a awesome, well-rounded, um, I don't know, festival of ideas up here. So thank you honestly so much um, on behalf of the audience and from me personally for coming and being a part of this. Um, I've learned so much and feel so legitimately inspired by all of your perspectives and knowledge. And I know that, I mean, learning all those things and gathering that hope strategy takes many, many years. So thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> and thank you guys so much for coming. This is an am amazing turnout and I hope you have a beautiful night at the Sugar Mountain Ball. A big thanks to Holly. Thanks. Go Holly. Yeah.